Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, I'm super excited to uh, tee up this next panel. So we started this morning with an amazing group of storytellers, right, to anchor us to where we've been in this movement, remind us of where we've been, um, and give us their insights into where we're at and where we need to go. We got to see a really exciting new data tool with, from Karthik, so everyone log on to API data and download that uh, data. Um, and then we were able to hear some concrete examples of action, right, of what it really takes to partner cross-racially, the depth of investment and trust and relationships that's required before you can really get to collective action. Um, and now we're gonna have a narrative panel. And this narrative panel is called um, Anchoring to Story, right? And so this is really about um, unpacking a bit what our current narratives are around our AAPI community and imagining what our story should be. So I am so excited to welcome to the stage um, Viet Tan Nguyen, Helen Zia, and Stephen Gong. Thank you. Could you? Oh. I think we're switching. Oh, okay, got it. It's okay. <laughs> Moving around. So Stephen for, is with the Center for Asian American Media, and he will be moderating today. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. And, and uh, yeah, actually, I did want to start just by congratulating you. Uh, <laughs> and and we'll, we'll have another chance, I'm sure, at the end of the day. But I did want to say, in teeing this up, um, it put a lot of pre We were taking notes, right? And we've, I've talked a little bit with Helen about this. And we felt the pressure ramping up as people going, OK, when we get to that narrative, we're really going to have the plan. So anyway, thank you very much. Um, no, it's, a, it's, um, it's such an honor and a privilege for me to uh, be part of this with two of the most uh, uh, talented right, uh, uh, figures in our community where you feel like, yeah, they're, they're telling our story. They've, they've got it. Um, we, we all benefit from the effort and, and the care that they put into their work. And one of the things I wanted to say, I'm, I'm supposed to be introducing myself and them, and this is put a clumsy way to get into the, into the introduction. Uh, Helen and, and Viet, in a sense for all of us, you know, need no additional um, introduction. They, their bios, their incredible bios are, are in our material. Um, but I wanted to say, you know, like Helen is, is an author and activist uh, in largely nonfiction. I did want to kind of emphasize to give us each a little bit of a, a lane and Viet, uh, of course, a Pulitzer Prize winner, MacArthur Fellow uh, for, for fiction and is working now even in a translation of, of his work into a long form uh, narrative uh, film or television, or whatever this new thing is that is happening in the media <laughs> landscape. Um, but both of them are also um, put a lot of time into thinking about the community and the well-being of the community and, and all of us in the room. So it's not like would normally be in a kind of talk like this where you're the celebrities. Uh, I, I do think you both have situated your lives to understand the connection between the professional work you do and the kind of real lives and communities it comes out of. So I wanted to acknowledge that and sort of encourage that as we respond and are thinking about the action that can come from narrative, it will be from that space. Um, I would just say for me a little bit, um, I, these last, six, what, 16 years, I'm the executive director of the Center for Asian American Media. Uh, to some of you OGs in the audience, that was Nata back in the day. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I've been associated with this organization for almost all of its 42 years. So um, it is incredible. And that's also a tribute, Carolyn, to what you were saying, that we have, we have a whole other new generation coming in. So that's incredible. To think when we started ours, we just wanted in a sense, a seat at the table. We just thought it was wrong that 
in all of the media images about Asian Americans, we knew there were no Asian Americans behind the camera, none of them who had written the works. It was based on, and it just seemed like, let's get some authentic stories going. Um, so we continued that work. We just finished a film festival um, called Camp Fest, and, and yet most of our work, I don't know if you know it outside of this region, is actually in public media. We support filmmakers uh, and, and the development of filmmaking talent so they can make documentary film largely for public television. And I would say one of the most important films for, that sparked the whole uh, Asian American civil rights movement was Who Killed Vincent Chin by Renee Tajima <laughs> And that Helen, of course, uh, uh, appears in the film and was an integral part, really, of, of that combination of how action can arise out of narrative. So I, I guess I wanted to place that piece there um, as we get started, okay? So with those introductions out of the way, um, we've got a few questions that we wanted to tee up and, and in our pre-talk, I guess one of the things we all agreed, like, we're not sure we want to, we feel equipped to tell people how best to bring about action in narrative, because you have, in, for one thing, I'm the moderator, so I, I can say this, you've got two individuals who have distinctive approaches to the way they use uh, narrative, and it's not, it's not, it's certainly not necessarily from thinking about what kind of public policy needs to be enacted, and then I'm gonna go do something about that public policy. So, so let's delve into, w w since we have these two wonderful people, let me uh, take each in turn. Would you mind talking about the way you think about narrative in your own practice, in your own work, and, and maybe differentiate as you, as you started in your careers and the way that maybe it's evolved. Do you have a different thinking about now the, the, the purposes, the function of narrative as, as you employ it? Okay, Viet, do you mind going first? Sure. You know, my background is that I was a, um, an Asian American studies um, student at UC Berkeley, and for me... Uh, yeah! Yeah, <laughs> right. Go Bears! Yes, yes. I went to Stanford and said, hey, thank you for inviting me to speak at the second best university in Northern California. <laughs> yeah. That's narrative, okay. So, but you know, uh, I was, I was, I, I admired writers who did narrative, and I admired activists. Uh, community activists, and so it was, there was always this dynamic relationship for me between the idea of the individual writer and the narrative that they uh, would pursue, and the narratives that come out of the actions of the community and, and activists. And I think that dynamic still exists for me. So I'll just give you one example. I, I wrote a short story collection called The Refugees, and it was about the Vietnamese refugee community. And I really took to heart this idea that we have to represent the community, <laughs> right? And so I had a whole spreadsheet making sure I talked about different kinds of characters and all that. But I was also writing that book under the awareness that Vietnamese people would be reading this book and that I had to represent them, okay? And I think that's a common impulse for a lot of us who are storytellers and activists, like what does the community think, what does my family think, and all that. That's, those are important ethical, moral, personal, political questions to ask. And then I wrote The Sympathizer, and with The Sympathizer I said, I already wrote a book for the Vietnamese people. The Sympathizer's for me. And uh, that book, I think, both of those approaches can lead to authentic storytelling, because that's what you, you brought up, but very different kinds of authentic storytelling. Because in the first case, you're worried about what the collective thinks. In the second case, speaking for myself, I only worried about what I thought. And I, in writing that book, I knew I was going to offend people. Uh, including Vietnamese Americans, and that's exactly what happened. There's a lot of Vietnamese Americans who don't like me, which is fine, I don't like them too, and, <laughs> and, and, and uh, they refuse to read the book because it's written from the perspective of a communist spy. And I, one thing that I think is important as we think about narrative, again, is not only how does the narrative serve the community for what the community wants, but how can the narrative both serve the individual vision, but also serving the community in a different way, which is telling the community what it doesn't want to hear. 
And I think that's what the sympathizer you know, tries to do both. So that's always been my relationship to it. And I think of myself as a writer who's deeply committed to an individual vision, but who's very aware that my individual vision wouldn't have been possible without all of the previous generations of activists and writers who came before. And having that genealogical awareness is very important for me in terms of crafting individual and collective narratives. Thank you, Viet. That was a great, great introduction. Helen? It's really inspiring to hear uh, how you come to your stories and, and what you want to, um, the de deliberation and thoughtfulness you um, put into it. I have to say my journey was um, much more circuitous because I started out at a time, you know, maybe even a, almost a generation before you yet. And so there was no Asian American studies. There were no women. There were no people of color who were telling any stories because, and I started out as a journalist. So um, the idea that I could write a book and get it published or even make a living out of it was just not anywhere in the cards. And I started out as an activist. And I know I'm speaking to a room full of change makers, funders who are making change and, and, ha and the question of how do you tell those stories. And so um, I was an activist for a good, I don't know, 10, 20 years before it dawned on me that what I really wanted to do after I was in Detroit, I had been laid off as an auto worker after two years of working in a factory and just having incredible experiences of people with people who were not Asian American in a, in a city like Detroit that did not have a large Asian American community. And I had gone there as an activist to be part of the labor movement most of my friends and fellow, uh, fe fellow factory workers were black, uh, some white, some Arab um, workers, but almost no Asian Americans. And so when we were all laid off and the misery of the, of, you know, we call that a recession, it was a depression in the Midwest, and it was another time of intense anti-Asian hate going on. And, um, and there wasn't an Asian American sensibility either. There was no pan-Asian um, identity except for the activists who had come out of the third world strike, the, um, you know, the student activists, which I was one. And so I just got to know people and their incredible stories. Um, and by stories, I mean their lives. Stories are about people's lives. They're about people's humanity. And so I never saw their humanity being represented. And so it wasn't so much about my own humanity, though I was you know, part of that mix. It was um, watching the news and seeing nothing said about the suffering that people were going through, working class people, the black community that I worked and lived among. And so, so I mean, I have to say, one day I was watching TV before remotes existed. And, and I got up, I was so angry, I yanked the cord out of the TV and I said something like, this stuff sucks, it's just shit. And then I thought, I could do this shit better than they're doing, <laughs> you know? And so it was a very low bar that I set for myself. Nobody was telling those stories, and I felt like somebody's got to tell. I, I, I know people and their stories, and I want their stories to be told. I want their humanity to be part of what's going on out there. And um, anyway, just to, to say it was, of course, that time that also all of the anti-Asian hate happened. You know, a young Chinese American named Vincent Chin was beaten to death by two white auto workers. And I happened to be in Detroit at that time, just starting out as um, starting out as a baby journalist and sort of knowing that, okay, do I get involved with this or what? Is that going to end my fledgling um, storytelling career? And I didn't think of it as storytelling at, at the time. And um, and well you all know the story, I actually did stand up and raise my hand and say, we can't end this here, this has to, we have to let the world know. We have to let the world know that this is not 
acceptable to our Asian American community that we can be beaten to death and the killers go scot-free and that we're okay with that. And it was an incredible injustice, not just to Asian Americans, but really to the whole, you know, whole of humanity and the idea of justice in America. But in a, in a largely black city to say, these are not the kind of men you send to jail. And so that's what really got me, um, you know, I mean, I went into journalism as, so, as an activist. That's how I got into journalism, to tell people stories. And, and I didn't lose my journalism career, but I started writing. I, in addition to my job job, you know, at a magazine, um, I was told by my editor, uh, I understand why you're doing this. You can't ever write about this for our magazine because it jeopardized my, quote, objectivity which is a whole nother story because there's no such thing as objectivity. And um, anyway, so, uh, so I freelanced too. I wrote under a pseudonyms, you know. Mm -hmm. I wrote for the only um, national Asian American uh, newspaper at that time. It's called East West Newspaper. Some of you, I think, might have worked for that in some way. It came out of San Francisco and wrote about the Vincent Chin story, what happened you know, his mother, um, and the terrible injustice. And so that then, in that time, went viral by print, you know, <laughs> standards. And we didn't even have fax machines then, okay? So it's not like we couldn't even fax them. Mm. But, um, but people sent them around. And, and that's how I learned about Asian Americans, too, not having had, you know, Asian American studies. There were mimeograph. Does anybody know what a mm -hmm. mimeograph is? Okay, the blue, <laughs> the blue ink that you would want to smell because you could get high as, a, as an eight-year-old, you know. Um, but there were mimeograph sheets that came out of, of, of L.A. and San Francisco about Asian American studies. And that's how people like me on the East Coast um, you know, started learning about second and third and fourth generation Asian Americans because on the East Coast, everybody in my little world was an immigrant or the child of Im immigrants and just trying to imagine things like, like what is life like for, um, for an Asian American who has fourth, fifth, sixth generation roots. Do they feel more American than I do? Because I don't feel American at all. And what is life like for the, the um, Vietnamese refugees who are being brought over and from, and from other parts of Southeast Asia that, uh, that I was seeing put in cities like Philadelphia and then having to leave en masse from Philadelphia because, um, because the situations they were, they were um, dumped in were so uh, difficult. And, and so that's where I start with my thoughts about um, writing and narrative as a form of activism. And, it, and so for me, it's, um, there are the things that I write that are for myself, but it's also with the, okay, how, what is the impact this is going to have? What is the, what is the master narrative that's out there? And I'm sure we're going to talk more yeah. about that. But what are, the, what are the assumptions people have? Karthik mentioned data is not just facts, but it's also what people think are facts, the assumptions that are out there. So what are those narratives about those? And, and that frames my writing. That's why I wrote, I wrote Asian American Dreams as a way to, to, to subvert and direct against the narrative that was coming out in the, in the mid-90s that was so incredibly um, anti-Asian, attacking so many of our different ethnic communities, and had to ask myself ethical questions like, well, I'm an um, ABC, you know, an American-born Chinese. Can I write about the Japanese American experience? Can I write about the Vietnamese or the Hmong American experience? Can I write about the South Asian experience? And those are all things that are part of, of, of Asian American dreams and just had to, and I say that because I hear that from other people. You know, I wanna write about this, but can I legitimately, can I authentically write about another community? And so that's where the, the journalistic um, training, if you will, comes in about like going to the community or the organizing, activist thing, going to the community, being the vehicle to, to sort of find the community voices and, and, 
and, and, and creating the space in a, in a written form, a storytelling form, so that their voices come through. So it's, and of course, I'm a conduit for that. I'm an agent for that. And, and have to remember that, um, you know, that I have to check back too and show my writing to the community that I'm writing about, you know, the, the individuals involved and say, does this accurately reflect what you were telling me through my lens? Anyway, um, so um, that's sort of my, my approach. To Thank writing. you, Helen. Yes, and I mean, we could pick up and we will try to return to a couple of those. I want to check the, our timelines, because I, like you, you know, I'm fifth generation already, so I'm gold rush Chinese on one side of my family. And, and yet, in reflecting, I, I remembered very much when I started teaching um, or lecturing at Cal, my classes, it was the early 90s, they were, they were they really the Viet, the Viet students were the most kind of vibrant and were just coming of age. And what I always think about, what I would say the uh, data point for me is, is the doubling of the Asian American population in the last 20 years in the Bay Area. And the viewpoints, the, the viewpoints about who I am or who we are, and, and, and at such a time of peril in the future of self-governance in America. I wonder, Viet, if we'll turn back to you. I'd love to hear more about your own personal reflection on race. I want to connect this back to, the, to today's talk, right? If we are to be part of a truly pluralistic America, if we who, and then Helen, you and I, you know, have been thinking about uh, racial justice and, and the, the myths, some beautiful but also completely wrong about America as a melting pot or as a successful, the world's only successful true democracy. Now we see it's uh, storm the Capitol. That was pretty close, you yeah. uh, know. But anyway. Uh, Viet, I think you, I, I invite you to think about uh, race, the way you understood it, and the way maybe did it affect, where did it affect your, your choice of, of craft, of art? Well, you know, I became an Asian American at UC Berkeley, um, trained by all the people that you probably read, like Ron Takaki, Elaine Kim, Saoling Wong. And the narrative was very much what you described. You know, this was the moment of multiculturalism, when multiculturalism felt revolutionary. And it was in some ways, because if you remember, remember back to the 1980s, 1990s, even to claim a diversity, uh, it, you know, the word diversity or multiculturalism was being interpreted as an attack, not just on the canon, but on the entire Western civilization. And I think that has sort of become a, the dominant narrative of Asian America from my point of view, which is that we're here, we're immigrants, we're outsiders, we're, for, we're perceived as foreigners, so we should claim the country, right? Um, and that was what I was educated in. And increasingly, I, I, I don't see myself in that narrative anymore. Uh, it's, it's very much an immigrant-driven narrative for Asian Americans and East Asian-driven narrative for Asian Americans. But as you said, the Vietnamese were coming in and other Southeast Asians, we came as refugees. Now, I go around saying there's a huge difference between refugees and immigrants. And the arrival of Vietnamese refugees, I think, really complicated the Asian American narrative because I was being taught by people who were uh, uh, graduates of Berkeley in the 1960s. And you know that narrative, revolution and you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, it was interesting, I read a review recently of J. Caspian Kang's Loneliest Americans, and the reviewer, hmm, and the reviewer, <laughs> The reviewer said, yes, it's rebe rebelling against that whole boomer narrative of the 1960s. So the Asian American revolutionaries have now become the Asian American boomers, according to a certain perspective. And I think there's a huge importance to the revolutionary narrative of the 1960s, but the boomer critique actually has some validity to me because what you see when you look at people who are not East Asian immigrants is a diversity of historical experiences that's, that can't be framed under diversity. For example, the refugees who came here, why did we come here? We came here because of America's wars in Asia. And I, you know, when we talk about reframing the narrative, this is very important for me because we talk a lot about anti-Asian violence and we talk about Vincent Chin, very important. But for me, the greatest acts of anti-Asian violence are not the domestic ones. They're the America's wars in Asia. And that's reframing the narrative. I mean, that we have to do that. Um, and we refugees came out of very politically complicated situations. I mean, the Asian American leftists and Marxists were like, what do we do with these Vietnamese revolution, Vietnamese people who are anti-communist, right? And so these contradictions are exactly where narrative needs to go. 
Because instead of shying away from the contradiction, we have to go into the contradiction to try to figure out how do we move to the next stage of the contradiction. And here we're, we're with the AAPI community, and one of the biggest contradictions for me is that if we start to think legitimately about Pacific Islander, Native Hawaiian experiences, not under diversity and inclusion, which honestly, we oftentimes don't have a lot of Pacific Islanders and Native uh, Hawaiians, but we think about that from a historical political perspective, it's about colonization. And that's another problem, you know, another contradiction that I think the Asian American mainstream narrative has a really hard time confronting. So one of the most exciting, or I don't know if that's the right word, but provocative movements now within Asian American studies is, well, let's think about Asian Americans not just as people claiming citizenship and belonging, but as colonizers in this country. How do we deal with that contradiction, that our equality is built upon our ownership, our participation in the continuing project of settler colonialism? And so these contradictions, I think, are so crucial, and they, they hopefully will force, are forcing Asian Americans to reconsider their narratives. And to think about the fact that now, for me, when I look around what's happening, on the one hand, I'm very happy. Because in, the 19, in 1990, we were like, oh, we need more Asian Americans in movies. Now we got it. <laughs> Is this what we want? <laughs> we need more Asian American representation. Now we have some of it. Is this what we want? I'm not gonna name names, but you know, it's like, you know, it, it's, a, it's a moment where I think it's actually good because now we can choose sides. Now, we, it's not just that we're all Asian Americans, that there are some Asian Americans who believe in this thing, and there are some Asian Americans who believe in this thing, and we should be criticizing each other. We should be sharpening our critique to see where our politics and our beliefs really lie. I, I, a, um, one of my board members uh, has told me, I think he's right, that the largest single funders of the Proud Boys are Chinese Americans. Yeah. Is that true? I believe so. <laughs> I'll, I'll say one more thing here. Like yes. back in the day, like in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, when that kind of stuff would happen, uh, Asian American activists, activists would say, those are not real Asian Americans. Yeah. My stance is, those are real Asian yeah. Americans, <laughs> and you better deal with it, because if just simply denying them on the level of authenticity does nothing, when we, we're actually pretty, I think we should be well, this is what being Vietnamese brought home to me, like there's a lot of conservative, racist Vietnamese people who are Trump supporters, right? They're Asian Americans. Yeah. And so we have to confront that versus trying to say there are some real ones and some not real Asian Americans. Instead, this, to me, one of the central contradictions of being Asian American is that we can celebrate our cultural uh, diversity and all that kind of stuff, that's great, but uh, ideological diversity, that's the real contradiction that we have to work through. Okay, we've... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, and... and, 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 and uh, to, to pull Helen back into this, you co-wrote a book on, on the tribulations of Wen Ho Lee, right? The Chinese scientist who was accused of being a spy. And I know that you've spoken very eloquently on, on what one path that lies ahead, uh, the war between the United States and China, and what stake we have in, in, in preventing that or... or uh, not being incarcerated in mass. I mean, um, and seeing uh, a repetition of history. Yeah, the repetition. So I. So let's bring it to today, Helen. And and I, it was beautiful. We had to talk about the critic, the contradictions that we need to face ourselves. So the. So even the notion. You know, it was a romantic notion. I was thinking, following Kartik's challenge of, well, we just need a lot more frames, a lot more narratives. They let a thousand flowers bloom, I, as one and a, person once said. That a hundred. Flowers bloom and a thousand uh, thoughts contend. Yes. <laughs> a quote okay. from Chairman Mao. <laughs> okay, so Helen, yeah. <laughs> it was school days, okay? We were young, we were impressionable. Yeah. Uh, yeah but no. yeah, build on this notion of, of the narratives we need or the narratives we, we must not... Uh, what glide over, right? Because it's better to be, I don't know, uh, to feel like we're above it in a way. I think what Viet is, t and you are talking about, is uh, complicating our stories. You know, the, the, the thing about we, we just need more stories. And there was a time I believed that too, because um, 
you know, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, we're so invisible to the world, we're so invisible to ourselves. It's heartbreaking for me to hear in the different panels before that even, you know, um, uh, RFPs are asking for things about, you know, communities and not including Asian Americans in there, that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders don't really address Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders and center them and, and, um, and so, when I think about writing something, you know, I really think about the different narratives that are out there. And I mentioned a master narrative. And the master narrative is, is, is the story that we believe, that the population in general believes uh, about any given topic. You know, but it's, it's, it's like the crawl that is on the screen, except it's not actually on the screen, it's in our brains and it's embedded in there, and it has been, we've been, you know, rendered uh, with this toxic material ever since we were, you know, born and could absorb any form of media, this, this um, narrative, master, you know, and we know what the master narrative of America is, you know, that this uh, uh, undiscovered, uninhabited continent was there for the taking, you know, by the n Northern Europeans who came and t took it, and, and so, uh, people of color didn't exist. You know, there was no genocide. You know, enslavement, things like that didn't happen. And 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 now are being banned from the state of Florida from being taught, or other other locations. And um, that's the master narrative. But we can drill down on that with with Asian Americans. It's that well, number one, if mostly we're invisible, right? The survey that, that that's out there. Um, can you say? can you name a single prominent Asian American or anybody? And the most common answer is don't know. And the second is, depending who you ask, either Bruce Lee or Jackie Chan. And the third one is either Jackie Chan or Bruce Lee, you know? <laughs> but it doesn't, you know, Bruce Lee's been dead 50 or so years and, and Jackie Chan's not even American. So, um, you know, but then if you do another survey and ask what is the greatest danger that America faces? It's the existential threat of China. And this is people who don't even, can't even find China on a map, right? And so, um, so given those two things, there is, there is a master narrative that runs through people's minds when they see people who remotely look East Asian, but we, can, we know from the pandemic that has included South Asians, it's included Pacific Islanders who have been attacked just because, just because. Right, and um, just because that hate is out there, and and I think as the data was showing earlier, that um, you know there's a lot of hate directed against a lot of groups, um, but so that hate or discrimination has taken the form of other things. Um, Stephen, you mentioned Wen Ho Lee. That's the that existential threat of China. China has been a football and has been used as a, as a threat, right? When you want to divide people and you want to distract people, the best way is to create an external enemy. We all must band together. We all must march under the flag, you know, no matter who's carrying that to take over, you know, the Congress, right? Um, and we cannot dissent from that. We cannot complicate it. We cannot uh, contradict the master narrative without consequences. And so, um, so I was talking to John Funabiki just the other day, who's doing a, a, a report on how the news media covers things. Right now, China as the existential threat to America is a master narrative. You cannot work in a, in a, in a uh, newsroom today and say, well, wait a minute, shouldn't we do a story about how, how actually maybe there are constructive ways of having dialogue? You can't say that in Congress. You can't be an elected official, a national elected official, um, without saying that unless you are a few, a few brave ones like uh, you know Congresswoman Judy Chu or Ted Lieu or some of our Asian representatives, but the rest, cannot. They can't fundraise, they can't get elected, it doesn't matter what party, and if you actually go into the, the history, and this is where history and context matters, um, you'll see pictures from the 1800s of an illustration, Democrats, Republicans agree, let's 
you know, ethnic cleansing of the Chinese, get rid of China, Chinese and the China question. And so that's an old refrain. And these are the master narratives that run through that whether we're writing fiction, whether we're writing, um, you know, uh, journalistic things or nonfiction or making films, I mean, it's, it, it's trying to picture the audience and what are they thinking? What's going through their head? And, and I think it's really challenging and confounding when we're in a time today where a 30, 30 seconds is too long for a, for a documentary video, you know? One screen of a story is about how much people can absorb. And so I always went long form. I always went for writing the longer stories, and now that's uh, much more of a challenge. But, um, but that's where we are today. And I, think, and I think when we think of our narratives, especially from our advocacy groups and, and so forth, we have to think about what is that narrative out there that's about us, and then what's our internal narratives? You know, that it's, it's like our, our communities are not just all East Asian, they're not just all Chinese, you know? Um, and they're not all the crazy rich Asians, and, the, and, they, and, and our communities don't agree about a lot of things. And I really, really think what um, Viet said about us being able to confront the disagreements in our communities um, are, are really important too. You know, if I were out there as a, uh, you know, instead of organizing, writing, I would want to go and actually tell those stories just to shine a light on them, to see can our communities talk about what real safety would be, what would make our communities, what would make grandma and grandpa feel safer about going for a walk. It's not just abolish here, it's not just more money for police here, and the two will never meet. I mean, that, is, that just gives more free reign to the right wing for our communities that feel like, well, our, our, our own advocates are not agreeing and not putting anything out there um, in the narrative that will make us feel safer, let alone be safer. But, um, you know, those are the things we really need to, to start talking about so that our communities will, you know, actually think we're confronting real things that we face. Thank you, and, and I, uh, realize I have failed in one of my chief duties as moderator, which was to uh, ask you all to please uh, think of a question you want to ask. We're going to switch it up a little. We'll have a little bit more time. We'll do try to do more than one. But there's blue cards on your table with pens. If you would, yeah, some people are reaching for them. This is great, because I think you've heard stuff. I'm sure you're thinking of things to ask. Uh, please write down the question, hold up the card, and they will be picked up by staff. And uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can, and we'll start in just a couple of minutes. I wanted to give um, maybe the next couple of minutes to Viet to, to place us in the same place today to sort of say, what are you, what are you seeing in a way? I guess I, I guess I wanted to do a little bit of a shout out, um, if I could, uh, Viet, to uh, Devan, the, the, the larger organization, I think what you put your time into is pretty incredible, which is not just your own work, but how do you stimulate, right, a generation maybe of, of, of Viet American writers? And, and, and what stories would you, you know, how do you feel about even, even trying to grasp a hold of what stories need to be told by the next generation. So DVAN stands for Diasporic Vietnamese Artist Network. The executive director, Isabel Thuy Pelo, is sitting here somewhere in the audience, right? Yes. Um, she and I go back a, more than a couple of decades to Berkeley, and the origins of DVAN were in uh, you know, uh, a group that we formed back then. Because we looked around and we're like, whoa, there's, where are the Vietnamese American writers and artists and all that? And we wanted to cultivate that and, and develop a community. So I think the first lesson that I learned is if, 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 you know, if stories aren't being told and organizations don't exist, you got to do it yourself. You know, and that's what we did, and 30 years later, we're 501c3 now. And uh, you know, part of the, the reason for you know, my passion for this organization is because I've been called a voice for the voiceless. 
Okay, I've never, called, I've never described myself that way, but that was literally what the New York Times book review said when the sympathizer came out. And I'm not the first person to be called the, a voice for the voiceless. So like if you're, if you're a so-called minority writer of whatever kind, uh, you might be called a voice for the voiceless. And it's weird, like how many voices for the voiceless are there, you know? Um, and I remember, you know, Aaron Dati Roy saying, uh, or writing, that there's really no such thing as the voiceless. There are only the deliberately silenced or the preferably unheard. Because if you know Vietnamese people, we're really, really loud. There's a lot of voices out there, but only some get elevated, right? So I, my motto is, no voices for the voiceless. Let's abolish the conditions of voicelessness. And abolition is a really powerful word because how do we abolish all of these gigantic structures of oppression that exist? It's gonna take a long time. So to abolish the conditions of voicelessness, voicelessness is not simply about having a, you know, a celebrity writer or whatever. It's about changing all kinds of structures to make a plethora of voices possible. That's what Devan does in its own way. And I think what I would say here is you know, I come from a particular generation that's been deeply influenced by the war, and uh, you know, I'm marked by that generational imprint, so I, I think about war and refugees all the time. I don't know if that's what the younger generations think about. And so when Divan creates, we have multiple writing residencies and writing workshops and all these kinds of activities for uh, all kinds of people, but we want to open the door for people to tell their stories without dictating what those stories are. Right, because I think this is one of the big challenges for as, as, as I now look at the fact that I'm more than halfway to death, uh, I, which is a fact, statistical fact. Just think you about know, where, where we are. are. Yeah. A little right. bit more. Yeah. We're more on the way. Yeah. I've had my chance, right? <laughs> and you know, the, the generational issue is can we give up power? Can we, can we, uh, and, I'm, and I'm grateful that, you know, my forebears you know, have never stood in my way of telling the stories I want to tell. And that's the same position I want to occupy and I hope Devan occupies, which is we don't want to stand in the way. Uh, maybe the younger generation of Vietnamese American writers will say, we don't want to talk about the war or refugees or whatever. That's fine. And that's exciting. And so that's what I think we should be invested in is creating the conditions for many voices, not in some kind of easy di diversity sense, but acknowledging that when we create this opportunity for many voices, there can be contradictions. You know, just like, what if, you're, what if, what if the, these new voices say things we don't want to hear? Well, that's what we have to deal with. They're coming from a different historical, cultural, generational experience that reflects something different. And so that's, I think, part of a challenge for any kind of activist community is realizing that our narrative may not be the narrative of the next generation, but we have to allow that to happen so that we can figure out where change is going to come from. Very good, thank you, thank you. And, and you know what jumps to my, my mind though is where we began this morning and saying, I mean, all of this would be, uh, would be just fine, but we are all stuck on one planet and, and we're facing ex existential crisis. <laughs> and um, we may not have the luxury unless we find out how to live together as one humanity. So I do think what I, what I meant to say by that is not to negate anything you've said, but it seems to me that, that what your work does for those of us who read it, and, and maybe for the films that we present at CAMFest, uh, in a sense is a reminder of what we share together as human beings, right, and this experience. And I remember in reading your works, you know, uh, via just feeling like I thought it might, this might be the perspective. And now someone's writing what I, what part of me imagined must be the, the contradictions of being uh, a, a child of this kind of violent war and now finding yourself in the country that perpetuated or that, that started it. Can, can I just- Yeah, please, you want to jump in? I, I just wanted to, to take the, the thought about a new generation and their stories, and, and yes, we, you know, we have to make a space for that. I also want to say that our stories, when we complicate them, should have a context. They don't exist, they, they have a context, not that they should, they do have a context. And, and that's where reviewers or historians look at them. But I really hope mm. that the stories that are told also don't forget that there is a history. So we're in a time today where one of the narratives is America is so divided. You know, uh, what, this group hates the other, they'll never come together, we just heard that, you know. Um, 
you know, black Americans and Asian Americans don't even connect. They think they hate each other. They make all these assumptions about each other. That's a narrative, you know? And we actually have many other narratives in history that show that there is solidarity. There has been, you know, we've heard some of those um, today. And, and, you know, in some of the talks I give, I have pictures, you know, of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King in the first row of one of the marches across this, uh, the um, Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. They're all wearing lays. Where did the lays come from? From contingents of Native Hawaiians who went to Alabama to be part of the civil rights freedom marches. And they weren't the only ones, you know, there were other Asian Americans too, but to just have a visual image of Frederick Douglass, you know, supporting Asian Americans and standing up against the Chinese Exclusion Act. Those are things that are part of our history that I also hope, you know, that in the stories of the future, you know, from future generations, that we don't forget that there is a context, you know, whether it's the forebears, you know, and what they went through, but to see it in a broader way. And, and, and that's what I mean complicating. Our, our stories, showing that that it's not just the info, you know, whatever infograph. Um, it, there really is much more beyond that, and to encourage that, to encourage questioning. When when Stephen, when you said um, that Chinese Americans are the ones who are funding the Proud Boys, th my first reaction was, is that true? Now I want to know. I you know, how do we know that? What are the facts behind that? And so I just hope every reader, viewer, you know, Let's check that out. media consumer, <laughs> you know, just ask the questions and dig a little deeper. That, and, and that will enrich all of our stories and our narratives, too. I, know that's, I feel like I've started a terrible <laughs> conspiracy. <laughs> just a committed a terrible... I'm going to be sorry for... Say, it's time for Q&A, and... And we're, we've got 10 minutes left. We're going to go lightning round. We're going to go fast. See how many more blue cards I can get through. Okay, this one, um, uh, you ring in on your buzzers when you think you have an answer. <laughs> Thoughts on affirmative action narrative? Huh? Because it's likely we're going to lose this one. Um, <laughs> do you have a, a thought about the narrative that we, that we are going to, you know, the Chinese against affirmative action is going to be the, the next nonprofit that we see, maybe. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to say there are a number of organizations, narrative change organizations out there working on, on just how to respond to that. We know what's going to happen. We know, we've seen this train wreck before. We know what's coming. Asian Americans are going to be presented as the wedge. We already have been when, you know, what's his name, Blum recruited some after failing with women and failing with a white man, then picking on it. So that context and that history has to be part of it. In our communities, we have to reach out and in language be talking to people so that they don't fall for these. But, but I just wanna say, you know, uh, there, are, there are suggestions, talking points, narrative structures that are already being created, but we know what's coming and we should all prepare for that. Um, the other part in, 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 in earlier this year, I um, launched the Vincent Chin Institute, which is to take on the other piece of the Vincent Chin story that people don't know, which is about the solidarity and the organizing, the pan-Asian ethnic solidarity and the multiracial solidarity and, and basically, you know, solidarity to fight everything that uh, is falling on our communities. Um, that's what we have to be looking at too, because in the climate of hate, um, that's not going to help. The existential threat of China, you know, has led to um, part of the hate pandemic that we've had these past three years. But the wedge, and this is another reason why we must constantly fight against the, the uses of these wedges wherever they are, but certainly the way our communities are being used is, you know, there will be a reaction to that. And unless we stand up uh, to that and speak out ab about it, then we are feeding, um, you know, the attacks that may come. So anyway, please, you can please do your research on how every one of us <laughs> and every one of our organizations can speak out, whether it's in your social media, whether it's in your families, whether it's in your communities, your churches, everywhere. Um, because we know what this um, decision is going to be from the Supreme Court. Thank you, Vet. Do you have any 
No. Uh, okay. That, then I'll try to give this one to you. What advice do you have for, for uh, students and alumni working to establish Asian American studies at their alma maters, especially when the administration's view of Asian Americans is is one that denigrates us as uh, hyper obedient. Hyper obedient. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean that that sort of gives you the answer there, you know, because uh, right. uh, then you then you demonstrate your lack of obedience, <laughs> you know. And uh, I speak as someone who graduated from Berkeley with what is it? Uh, two majors, three degrees, and four uh, misdemeanors. Okay, so <laughs> you, you are uh, clearly an underachiever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and you know, I mean, we 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 in our own way, you know, as Asian Americans in the '90s, we struggled, we protested, we got arrested, precisely around these kinds of issues. We already had Asian American studies, but we were demanding more, which we don't, you know. So I think at, at, we see it all over the country that there are these activist movements on college campuses where students, when they're finally pushed too far or neglected for too long, they, they get arrested, they have protests, and I think that's what, you ha that's what we have to do. I mean, politics and activism is always, I, guess, I think it's a dynamic between you know, having nice, polite tactics and then having some aggression at the same time. So th that, I think, is the short answer, and then the long answer is, it's a long struggle, obviously, but if the questioner is coming from places where the struggle has been going on for 10 or 20 years and there hasn't been a protest or an occupation of the president president's office yet, do it. <laughs> I did. Me too. <laughs> um, and as far as alumni, we know, uh, especially Asian Americans, the uh, Alumni Council and the president are going to come with their hand out. That's how they look at Asian American alumni. And so, any Asian Americans who are thinking of contributing to their uh, alma maters, ask for something in exchange for that money. We want Asian American studies to be taught. Otherwise, the money is not gonna go to you. And, and, and so too often our communities just think they're the obedient, whatever, let's give the money. It, you know, I'll put my family's name on it. That's not enough. We're at a time where we really must ask, ask and not necessarily politely work with the students, they can take over the buildings and the alumni can say, and we have this money, but, you know, listen to the students. So. I'll just observe that both Kartik and Helen went to Princeton, <laughs> and you guys have leverage, so. But we had to, fight. that was a 50 year battle <laughs> to get any Asian American studies there, so. What gave you both, this will be, might be our last one, but what gave you the confidence to believe in your voice and your story. It's been remarkable, I'll just say, sitting on stage with you, because you guys have so much confidence, but you, you go ahead, tell us. <laughs> tell us, go. Well, let's see. It took me a long time before I even thought of writing. Uh, I love to write, but I never thought. And, and so, I guess I would just say, um, um, you know, it was one step at a time. Uh, there was a time when I would have thought I would just die be, on the way to having to speak in front of a group like this and to, to be that shy Asian kid because I never saw anybody like me. And, and so I took that first step. I have no idea what I said. It was at a demonstration, in fact, for a, a, a third world center, you know, at that school. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and when the earth didn't open up and I didn't fall in it, and I saw actually we did get a, a third world center, um, that empowered me to speak a little more and a little more. And I was just saying that I was nervous to get on stage today. I mean, you know. Um, so the the but the more you do it, the more you raise your voice, the more you're out there, whether it's you know agitating or demonstrating or going to your legislators or or, or going into journalism, um, it becomes a little easier. But you also can, to the point of the earlier uh, session, you change yourself and you can help change the world too. And so that's part of doing the work, speaking out. We can all do it. Mm. 
That was beautiful. I mean, very similar to, to uh, what Helen said, you know, because when I was an undergraduate and graduate student, I barely said a word. Now look at me, you can't shut me up, you know? <laughs> so yeah, you just keep on doing it. But I'm, I'm gonna say that, um, you know, to be a writer in my, in my case uh, involves a lot of sitting alone in a room for literally thousands and thousands of hours and, and suffering in your own way. And I learned how to do that because I w I'm a Catholic. You know, I, I, uh, I was uh, raised by very devout Catholic parents, sent to Catholic school my entire life, was uh, immersed in a Vietnamese Catholic community, which is extremely conservative. And I watched my parents suffer. I mean, they worked 12 to 14 hour days every day of the year in their grocery store. And they never wanted me to do that. You know, and I didn't want to do that. But I saw them suffer and sacrifice. And I think I internalized all of that. And so um, that's the refugee background. You know, if your parents are sacrificing everything to make your life possible, then what's like being a writer is nothing compared to that. And then finally, all credit to my parents, contrary to stereotypical narratives, you know, not all Asian parents are mean. You know, it's like <laughs> my parents were actually very supportive and they, they, you know, lavished me with like unwarranted compliments when I was growing up. How shocking, you know? <laughs> and so they, they never insulted me. They're like, oh, you're so smart. And, <laughs> and uh, so that, that helped to provide the basis of self-esteem, <laughs> right? So again, unwarranted. But the point is, you know, as you raise your kids, think about what your words are saying, because I think it does make a big difference um, what the parents do and say in terms of modeling things for their children, you know, to, uh, to be certain kinds of people. Well, wow, that's beautiful. Um, so why don't we thank all of our <laughs> model human beings. Thank you. It's, it's been a real pleasure, and I, I hope we can help. We've helped pull some of these threads together, I guess. I, I, I guess I would just say on behalf of, uh, of Viet and, and Helen, I think, I think we feel like we're, we're very much part of a... A, a vibrant and, and supportive community, and uh, it, it sort of validates the callings, I think, that we have found ourselves in doing, because this is what, this is better than anything I ever thought I could do, and I, it's, you know, what the heck. We may not be economically secure completely, but we have community, and that's beautiful. So thank, thank you, you all. Thank you. <laughs> That was, uh, that was beautiful. Thank you yeah. so much.